Good morning, everyone uh, from all around the world. It's happy to see everyone. We have about 45 uh, participants today uh, for an exciting talk. Uh, but before we begin, I do want to mention that uh, MPWB, Medical Physics for World Benefit, is again pleased to provide an opportunity for medical physicists from low to middle income countries to virtually attend the APM annual conference. Last year, the support was a great success, and MPWB was able to support nearly 40 medical physicists to attend the meeting. Uh, if you have not received the email, uh, please go check out the website, uh, www.mpwb.org, and uh, you will find uh, the link for the Google form. We do plan to uh, post the link to the form on the, in the chat also, so please take a look out for that. Uh, that being said, uh, good morning, Dr. Schreiner. Uh, thank you so much for uh, accepting to give a great talk today on modern cobalt-60 radiotherapy te technology. Uh, my partner, uh, co-partner, moderator, uh, Sarah, uh, could not make it today, so I'm sorry, you have to bear with me uh, moderating the session. Uh, A little bit about Dr. Schreiner. Uh, he is the president of Medical Physics for World Benefit, uh, Professor Emeritus of Oncology and Physics, Engineering, Physics, and Astronomy at Queen's University, past president of the Canadian College of Physicists and Medicine, founding scientific committee member for the International IC3 Dose Conferences on Three Dimensional and Advanced Dosimetry. So today's talk will be about uh, 45 minutes. Um, we will have a Q&A for about five, 10, uh, five to 10 minutes. Uh, then a final comments and uh, thank you. There will be multiple choice questions that will be shared with uh, all the attendees uh, at some point this week that you know, uh, if you need credit or some sort of a certificate of attendance, you will have to answer these questions. The webinar will be recorded posted online and shared with the community. Uh, we also have a YouTube page that uh, I would highly recommend everyone to check out. For any questions that you may have regarding today's talk, I would uh, please suggest or request everyone to type in your questions in the chat and uh, we will try our best to see if we can get through all the questions today. Uh, if not, then, uh, we can even share the questions with Dr. Schreiner and uh, at some point, you know, uh, he can reply to all the answers and we'll share it with uh, all the attendees. Without further ado, uh, I will stop sharing my screen and then Dr. Schreiner, you can share uh, your screen. Well, thank you, Archie, um, for the nice introduction. Uh, can you see my screen there? Excellent, excellent. Um, you keep saying that uh, I'm going to give a great talk. That wasn't in the uh, in the uh, job you gave me. You said to give a talk, so uh, <laughs> I do hope it will entertain and tell a story. But uh, uh, we'll we'll leave it to the end to decide if it's a great talk or not. So uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, cobalt sixty. Uh, and uh, I always like to start a talk by giving a little bit of a sense of where I am at or where I'm from. Uh, I'm in Kingston, Canada. Uh, so Kingston is right here. We're centrally isolated uh, in uh, Eastern Ontario. So we're halfway between Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa uh, is uh, a couple of hours away, our capital city, and we're just a little bit above Syracuse, New York. So. We're close to everything, but far enough that we live relatively peaceful lives at the edge of Lake Ontario. And um, so as I'm telling you this story, uh, I'm going to give some acknowledgments of the people that have helped me um, over the years to do this work. Uh, very good colleagues at uh, the Cancer Center in Southeastern Ontario and uh, a number of colleagues uh, 
across Canada and uh, the world who are interested in cobalt and some very great students who uh, have helped uh, acquire all the data that I get to tell everybody about. Uh, I should declare that I have a, uh, had a research partnership for um, over a decade and a half with uh, Best Theratronics in Canada. I, in fact, over uh, this project, I've worked with various versions of Theratronics uh, as they were going through their, um, um, their uh, industrial development. Um, and uh, much of this work was sponsored, uh, was industry sponsored matched funding with uh, various Ontario research uh, uh, opportunities and with the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. So the story I am going to try and tell is outlined here. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about cobalt. Uh, at one time, everybody knew what a cobalt unit was. Uh, these days, everybody has heard that there was once this unit, uh, but it's no good anymore, so let's not worry about it. Uh, but I'm going to try and, and uh, introduce you to what the cobalt unit is, remind you of its legacy. Uh, say a little bit about where it is in the scheme of things these days. And uh, then I'm going to say, well, can you actually do modern radiation therapy with uh, a cobalt unit? Uh, I'll review the literature a little bit, seeing what others have done, show you a little bit of what we tried to do in Kingston and give you some idea. Um, show that it isn't just uh, dose delivery that's important, but... Uh, uh, we also want to do image guidance these days, so talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to give some personal views of where I think uh, things have been, and so I'll do some editorializing. I'm going to give a spoiler alert, and uh, that spoiler alert is that the main theme and the way I'm going to focus most of the discussion is to dispel a common misconception about cobalt. Uh, based radiotherapy. And that is that it cannot deliver modern radiation therapy. This is uh, totally false. And I think uh, a, a number of people have shown that it's false, but that hasn't really gotten out there. So everybody still thinks of all the problems, but they don't think of uh, some of the good things about cobalt. I should state at the beginning that uh, my talk is devoted completely to external beam radiation therapy uh, and specifically in a setting where I, I, I can treat multiple diseases. So I will not be talking about brachytherapy. I will not be talking about gamma knives. Uh, I'm talking mainly about EBRT. So what is cobalt? Uh, cobalt is a, a radioactive source. Cobalt-60 is a radioactive source. It is uh, manufactured uh, by uh, bombardment of cobalt-59 in a nuclear reactor. And after that uh, reaction, after uh, uh, some time, that uh, cobalt-59 turns into cobalt-60, which is a radioactive um, uh, material, it decays with a half-life of about 5.26 uh, years uh, via beta decay, and it decays to nickel. And uh, as it's in an excited state, as that nickel uh, relaxes to its ground state, it gives off two uh, gamma photons of energy 1.17 and 1.33 MeV. And if I put that radioactive source in a correct configuration into a unit that has a uh, heavy shielding, I can push that source to a hole in the shielding and I can then use that 1.25 average energy uh, beam to treat disease. And that was the... Um, the, uh, uh, the ideas and the design that came in the creation of these units. Oh, 
So if I look at the, uh, at the spectrum of photons that I'm getting out of a cobalt unit, I'm getting the two gamma um, peaks from the, the, the decay. And I'm also going to get some low energy photons from scatter that's going to happen in the head of the machine. So there is uh, some scattered photons. And in fact, this becomes quite important if you do Monte Carlo modeling of, uh, of the physics and, and the dosimetry. Um, and this would be if I'm comparing it here to a nominal 6 MV X-ray beam. And I used to like to uh, tease Rock Mackey that a cobalt beam is just a clean version of a dirty X-ray beam. Uh, so here is uh, what the beam looks like. And we'll come back to this in a, in a short while. Sorry, my mouse is catching a little bit, so I'm gonna to go to the keyboard. Um, or not, sorry. Okay. Um, this development actually had a heavy Canadian contribution. Um, and uh, uh, many of the original players in the ideas and the development of the medical applications of uh, cobalt uh, were in Canada. Uh, a medical physicist that many of you would know the name of is, is Harold Johns, uh, who is kind of the grandfather of uh, medical physics in Canada and in actually much of the world. Uh, he wrote with Jack Cunningham the uh, what was the Bible of medical physics for many, many years. So this, sorry, I'm really jumping here. Um, so this team worked in uh, London and Saskatoon to uh, develop uh, uh, the first two units that were used to treat disease um, in, the, in the 50s. And uh, here we can see a, a little montage of uh, uh, some of the units and some of the characters that were involved in the early days. The unit was actually quite outstanding for its time and it was um, really brought about a high energy treatment of, uh, of cancers. And it was so exciting that it actually made the popular press as, uh, as um, uh, it, uh, it came out and began to be used. So we have some articles in Reader's Digest and uh, in Maclean's uh, on this. Uh, for Canadians on the line, uh, this article here was reproduced in full in one of the early interactions, uh, actually, uh, the medical, medical physics newsletter for, uh, uh, for Canada uh, back in the 90s. If you're interested in this history, there's a lovely article that just came out uh, uh, a couple of years ago in uh, the IOMP uh, journal, Medical Physics International, written by uh, Jake Van Dyke and Jerry Batista, uh, to, uh, colleagues at, uh, in London. Uh, many of you would know uh, Jake and Jerry. And uh, with Peter Almond uh, uh, from, uh, from Texas. And it's a, a really complete uh, discussion of uh, the development of cobalt radiotherapy. And I'd really encourage you to uh, take a look at it. So the unit has developed quite, uh, uh, quite a bit over the years and gone through uh, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of uh, change, but at the end of the day, it's always the same uh, source in a shielding that can move around uh, and uh, and be controlled uh, um, that, that sh the shape of the field being controlled by uh, um, whatever 
unit it is, it, it is in. So where is it in the scheme of things? And here, I'm just going to do a little adjustment on my screen here for a second. Well, if we look at what's happened over the years, Cobalt 60 established, again, as I said, MV photon therapy or MEV photon therapy in the clinic. And for the next 20 years, it really was the workhorse for clinical radiotherapy in much of the world. But in the 80s, it uh, began to fall out of favor and much of radiotherapy went to linear accelerator X-ray units, uh, and they became the mainstay of radiation therapy. And if you look in much of, uh, of high-income countries and middle-income countries, linear accelerators have become the dominant uh, treatment device. And part of that is because of a, a perceived lack uh, in the development of the units, and which we'll see uh, uh, is, is a bit uh, uh, simplified. The units are have developed, but they, they were very slow catching up on the linear accelerators. If we look at uh, what that has meant on the number of units uh, in the world, if we uh, uh, see here uh, from um, that uh, Medical Physics International paper that I, I pointed to you uh, a while ago, Jake has a nice graph showing that uh, cobalt did really, was the major device out in the clinics for many, many years until the 80s. And that's when the Linux began to develop and really, really uh, started to expand. And uh, Brendan Healy has shown similar uh, data in a, in a uh, paper and here he, they were looking at uh, the um, number of units that uh, the IAEA does TLD work with. And, you know, this, this change in uptake of, of, of the unit might be an issue uh, in the world. Uh, as many that are on the line know, uh, there is a increasing need for radiotherapy in low and middle income countries. And much of cancer in the world is in low and middle income countries. And yet the, the uh, populations of these countries do not have access to radiotherapy. And only a small uh, uh, proportion of people who would benefit from radiotherapy uh, can get radiotherapy in many countries. So there is a need for additional machines and, uh, you know, cobalt is not considered in that uh, right now. And if you look at the distribution of machines, you can see that um, most of the machines that are in clinics are actually uh, um, in countries that are uh, middle income, high income. And in low income and low and middle income countries, there really is not the um, uh, number of machines per population that one really, really needs. Now, I'm not going to go into too much of a, a, a discussion of this because, again, uh, Jake Van Dyke has done an excellent, excellent analysis of this, and uh, you are all welcome to see it. It was a uh, um, an MPWB webinar in November, uh, and that webinar is on the uh, uh, MPWB YouTube channel. So I would really encourage you if you, you want to see a little bit more about uh, the needs for access, please go take a look at, at Jake's excellent talk from uh, uh, about six months ago. So again, what are some of the um, disadvantages that are perceived? Why did it fall out of favor? Well, uh, for many, many years, the main criticism was the photon energy, the low photon energy, the fact that because it has a, a, a big source, you cannot get the nice shadows that one would get with a nice uh, pinpoint source. 
And so there is a, a larger penumbra and a softening at the edge of the beams. Um, also, uh, which would lead to slower dose gradients, uh, uh, worse conf conformality, perhaps worse uh, uh, sparing of uh, organs at risk uh, because of the uh, penetration issues. The units do not have the radiation output that uh, a LINAC can have, especially some of the modern LINACs uh, when you take the, uh, the filters out. And uh, you need to replace the source uh, every five and, uh, five and a bit years if you want to maintain good patient throughput. And recently there has been a, a concern about uh, security. So those are the main criticisms that have, um, have uh, come about. The um, spectrum that I showed you gives you this kind of penetration. And again, I, I uh, thank Jerry Batista for uh, a number of the slides that I'll be showing. But here we have the uh, percent depth dose for cobalt. And it's very close to the percent depth dose actually for a 4 MV beam, but not quite as penetrating as a 6 MV. And remember in, in uh, uh, the 80s and 90s, there was still a thinking that uh, beams should have highest energy to get the most penetration. Uh, we eventually learned that uh, these really high energy beams uh, didn't really give that much benefit and had a lot of uh, concerns with them. But um, you know, at the thinking at the time, I think was part of what drove uh, the, the uh, cobalt uh, the perception that it wasn't penetrating enough beam. And sure enough, if you want to treat me, uh, my pelvis, uh, um, with a uh, cobalt beam or with 6MV, I'm definitely going to not have the penetration if I want to have a, a high dose at my prostate, say, uh, um, I would get a considerable dose at the surface. But we've known the solution to this for many, many years. The solution is that you don't treat from one direction. You treat from multiple directions. You rotate uh, the, uh, uh, and treat uh, uh, from many directions. And again, I thank uh, Jake for having found this picture that I, I wanted to put in. And he had, had it nicely in his article the, uh, in MPI. So if I can go to multiple uh, directions, then this, uh, um, this penetration issue begins to fall away. It's still there if you're doing four field boxes, but as soon as I, I start going to a larger number of fields, um, that penetration problem goes away. And we see that with Linux these days all the time. Most of the IMRT that is done in the world is done with 6MV uh, photon beams. Very little uh, uh, IMRT is done at higher energies because of some of the technical concerns. Now let's talk about penumbra. Penumbra is another issue that always comes up. Uh, uh, yet um, we have seen that the profile of the beam actually isn't as important as we thought because these days we're actually treating with flattening free uh, photon beams, which I would uh, loosely say are all penumbra, uh, and not because of uh, uh, the edge, but because of the shape. I do not have a flat field. And yet we can do a lot of treatment with these kinds of flattening free beams in, in, in VMAT, because if I give my treatment planning system the data, from the beam, I can account for the shape of the beam at the edge, and I can actually correct for it as I'm doing my treatment planning. Now, are there some advantages? Well, there are actually considerable advantages to a cobalt unit. Uh, simplicity of operation, uh, low infrastructure requirements. You do not need to have uh, uh, high integrity uh, power. Uh, you do not need to have uh, water cooling uh, and all the systems for that. Um, the beam uh, characteristics are well understood and standard. 
The cobalt beam has a steady output. That output is decaying, but it is very well known. And in fact, that becomes a huge advantage to the physicists in a clinic because they have a device that they can use to do quality assurance on their dosimetry systems. So that's one big bonus that uh, sometimes we forget about. And they're reduced to operational costs. And as I will show, you can deliver modern radiotherapy with them. Uh, I'm not gonna go into an extensive analysis, but I will point you to two papers that review this. Uh, again, Brendan Healy wrote in Clinical Oncology, a nice analysis of uh, the service costs for various units and showed that uh, a cobalt unit uh, uh, was uh, considerably uh, uh, less expensive to run and maintain, even with the source changes and everything that you would have to do on that unit. And uh, a very recent paper um, by uh, Rachel M McCarroll and colleagues uh, has a really interesting outlook. They did a model for estimating uh, the downtime of, of uh, EBRT units in various countries. And in their analysis, what they looked at was they actually looked at uh, how good is the power supply in various countries. So they, they did an analysis where they identified countries of having many outages uh, per month, you know, on the order from 10 to 30, 30 outages a month. That, that's, you know, every second day, every third day, every, every day uh, uh, in uh, some countries. Other countries are a bit more stable and other countries are, are uh, uh, quite robust. But they, they then use this to determine how would this affect the throughput of patients in a clinic if I have these different conditions. And so they had a baseline that they based on uh, doing uh, using their cobalt units. Uh, and then they looked at what percentage of, uh, uh, how would this percentage change if this was taken at a, as about 100% under these different criteria of many outages, some outages, few outages. And they showed that LINAC deliveries in countries where there is a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, unstable power has considerable uh, effects. You're only treating about a third of the patients that you want to be treating. So a very nice analysis, uh, a really good paper. So now the next uh, 20 slides or so, I'm just going to show you the potential and, and, and the viability of doing modern, modern radiotherapy with, uh, with a cobalt unit. And I'll start by looking at some of the literature. Much of it in the early days was modeling literature so there was a nice paper by Adams and Warrington in around 2008, where they uh, compare, uh, in those days, they, they were just using contours. Uh, they didn't do a, uh, 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 but they showed a, a lot of the contours for various of cases. Uh, and they were comparing uh, cobalt 60 delivery uh, with blocks and compensators against IMRT, uh, uh, MLC-based deliveries at 6 or 10 MV uh, x-rays. And they showed that uh, in many, many cases, the cobalt deliveries were as, uh, as conformal, as good as the, the IMRT. Fox and colleagues uh, that same year also published similar, similar results where they were looking at uh, beam uh, quality looking at the number of beams that you would have to deliver to, uh, uh, to get good delivery. And they, just, they showed that again, uh, with commercial cobalt uh, 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 units at the time, with the appropriate design of the MLC, IMRT type plants were quite, uh, 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 quite equivalent between um, the six MV, um, and the cobalt units. Very recently, there, there, and there's been continued work that showed this. Very recently, there was some nice work out of uh, Washington Medical Center in Seattle, uh, trying to see how could we uh, make 
simple modifications of a cobalt unit, uh, or actually it, it, they say it either for a cobalt unit or for a simple LINAC, how would we be able to do some kind of IMRT using compensators? So they uh, 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 designed a simple ring-based system for uh, using multiple beams with uh, uh, multiple compensators and then delivering the radiation either from a cobalt or a linear accelerator uh, to get the IMRT. And again, they show some uh, nice work comparing 6MV distributions to cobalt distributions. And uh, again, showing that for multiple cases, the uh, uh, cobalt gives comparable uh, um, those to distributions to, to the cobalt. So they have this new uh, compensator-based system that they've proposed, and it suggests that uh, it is capable of delivering in a time-efficient matter. They do some time analysis for the deliveries. Uh, these complicated IMRT uh, type of deliveries, and um, that uh, even with the cobalt unit, with the dose rates available on the cobalt unit, you can get treatment times of less than five minutes, slightly longer than what we get in, uh, 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 in x-ray deliveries, but it's quite comparable. And again, they say there are a, a lot of uh, benefits to this simple approach in terms of uh, access. And the final example I'll give of other people's work is where at one time in the last decade, a cobalt unit was the most sophisticated unit that was out there for radiotherapy and delivery. And that was the, uh, uh, the view ray um, meridian co three-headed cobalt with an MR unit uh, on it. So it, the, there were three heads, each had uh, sets of MLCs that could be turned on as the uh, unit rotated about the patient to give, again, very uh, conformal IMRT-like uh, deliveries. And the advantage with this particular unit was that one could do imaging, MR imaging, at the same time, and one could actually look at the dose distributions online during, uh, uh, as the treatment was uh, uh, um, being set up and, and then followed uh, to show what the dose distributions would be like on these images. And uh, there have been a number of publications uh, showing uh, the results of this uh, very sophisticated delivery. Uh, a nice summary by Wooden and all in the Red Journal recently, again, uh, looking at uh, numerous cases in different sites, said that the uh, Cobalt 60 device could produce highly conformal treatments similar in quality to a LINAC IMRT. All the plans were achieved, achieved the uh, uh, target coverage and uh, organ at risk sparing, similar to the LINAC plans. And uh, in all cases, the plans were uh, uh, clinically acceptable. A uh, recent, uh, more recent review of that work shows uh, one of the uh, uh, motivations for this MR-guided radiotherapy, which is adaptive replanning. Uh, and here they uh, show a case where uh, they did the imaging, projected the image, uh, the plans on those images, could see that there were some failures in the expectations of uh, uh, the uh, doses to organs at risk. And so they could do replanning before the delivery was happening. Uh, uh, on that day so that uh, the patient would receive the intended uh, uh, delivery. I will admit that that cobalt unit was very active in its heyday, uh, but um, the uh, view ray did uh, also some amazing things on the design of a LINAC uh, uh, in this unit and uh, 
most of the units now are uh, are uh, being upgraded to a Linac based delivery. Okay, well, what about uh, Kingston? What have we seen here? And I, I want to tell this as a bit of a story because uh, it actually reflects some of the thinking I have on uh, on uh, where we are with cobalt and, and uh, what cobalt can do. So I found this slide from an early talk that I gave in 2000. And when I first joined the clinic uh, in Kingston, uh, it was an amazing clinic, lovely clinic, but it had um, a series of linear accelerators at the time. It had four linear accelerators that were towards the end of their uh, cycle. So they weren't quite 10 years old. And when they had been purchased, they had been purchased without MLCs, without any uh, imaging. So in 1997 in Kingston, our LINAC fleet was not able to do any of the conformal, uh, 3D conformal or um, uh, IMRT that was coming down the line. So we had uh, an old 2100EX and we did have a cobalt unit. It was being used sometimes to treat uh, breast patients, but it was slowly uh, uh, being used less frequently. And so it was becoming available for research. So we had a dedicated um, unit that we could use to do some research. And just around that time, Rock Mackey had started proposing the tomotherapy work. And his initial tomotherapy unit was a 4MV LINAC Actually, here he's saying a 2100. So uh, this might have been a picture a, a little later that they put a um, a uh, a narrow fan beam MLC on, and they were rotating phantoms around on a bench top jig. So they had made a very simple jig to investigate. The, uh, to actually do some deliveries and show the potential for, for tomotherapy. So we thought, why don't we do the same thing? So in fact, we used our cobalt unit to start to investigate tomotherapy and to start to learn the issues for IMRT. So we were actually learning about optimization. We were learning about planning, we were learning about dose delivery in an IMRT, we were learning how to evaluate plans on our cobalt unit that we had uh, that we had available to us so we could do research. And in a small clinic where, you know, uh, uh, research time uh, is, is somewhat limited, this gave us a facility where we could really learn to do IMRT uh, on, on the cobalt unit. In fact, our very first try, we didn't even have a jig. It was all manual. It was all with rotating stages and pencil beams and uh, translating through. Uh, we had a summer um, student who uh, must have uh, put on a few hundred kilometers going in and out of the room uh, doing some simple deliveries. And this was one of our first plans of uh, what we thought was an amazing formal type delivery with a cobalt unit. We actually measured that with a uh, uh, polymer gel, which I still have in my garage uh, here in Kingston. Anyway, so we had this dedicated unit and that enabled us to do a lot of the modeling that would, was needed to uh, uh, see um, uh, to generate Monte Carlo uh, 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 data that we could validate with Monte Carlo and to do some uh, uh, planning studies and such. But we had always this machine that we could base the work on. And so some of the things we had to realize is when you have a, uh, a larger source than the pencil beam source, the behavior of your MLC 
uh, leaves and the behavior uh, uh, of the little small fields that you have is very different than you would have uh, uh, versus a, a 6MV Linux, say. So um, uh, pencil beam algorithms uh, do not work as well because as soon as you start going off axis, things begin to shift. And uh, uh, Sandeep Danisar, who is now in, uh, in Texas, did a lot of amazing work uh, analyzing this and trying to figure out how we best model these, uh, these uh, different beams and these different uh, little pencils. And actually, uh, she went to an aperture based where you could have a, uh, a family of different uh, apertures of uh, uh, different sizes instead of just the pencil beams. And that made the, uh, the uh, planning of the, uh, of the fluence patterns uh, across the MLC much better. And again, because we had a unit, we could actually validate that the models that uh, we were generating were correct. And then uh, subsequent to that, we started doing a lot of Monte Carlo based studies, uh, 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 again, replicating the type of work that Fox and Adams had done, showing that uh, the deliveries of uh, a cobalt unit versus a 6MV unit were very, very similar. And uh, in the next uh, few years, uh, we published a bit of this work showing uh, how, the, uh, how well uh, our deliveries could be on some simple uh, 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 constraints for simple targets, validating it against film measurements, and eventually going to 3D work. Uh, some of this work has been published uh, I will say one of the challenges of working on Cobalt has been um, sometimes reviewers have not been as generous as one would like. And uh, when we started to go to three dimensions and uh, Sandeep did many, many plans on many cases, again, getting input from the clinic on how the IMRT had been done to treat a case using the contours that the physicians had set for the IMRT cases and then bringing it over to co Cobalt. Uh, we, uh, she did some very nice work in her PhD, uh, still hoping to get it published. At the time, the reviewers said, this is very interesting. This is, uh, no, this is very carefully done. This is very good work, but who cares? It's not of any interest, it's Cobalt. And, uh, we're hoping that uh, in the last few years, some of those attitudes might have changed. Anyway, the, uh, so the delivery potential for modern radiotherapy is really, really there. And I will just show you a few slides. We also wondered if you could do some image guidance. And with those jigs, we were able to uh, put an imaging panel uh, on our test bed and do some cobalt imaging. And uh, we did some uh, uh, imaging of uh, a rando phantom. You can appreciate that there's not a lot of contrast in there, uh, but we also had a really nice pelvis uh, 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 phantom that uh, had considerable uh, contrast. And we, and we tried various imaging. And again, comparing cobalt images against uh, the imaging that we were getting on our 6MB unit. And one can see that definitely you can make out bony landmarks and you can actually uh, do uh, uh, some uh, assessment that you are treating in the correct areas. We actually tried to do some uh, uh, cone beam CT and uh, it was very, very interesting except the doses were extremely high. Um, so uh, using the, 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 the head, uh, the source in the head of the unit uh, would not have been an appropriate way to uh, image a patient. But we do think that perhaps with uh, a redesign of that source, you might be able to also do cone beam imaging with a cobalt source. Uh, I will just put it aside. I haven't shown it here. Uh, you can do some really neat industrial 
imaging with a cobalt MV uh, CT system. Uh, we actually showed, uh, uh, verified the shielding that was poured in a couple of our, con uh, uh, of our bunkers, uh, showing the uh, distribution of uh, hematite in, uh, in, in, um, in those cores. And we also uh, did some archeological work on some artifacts that were uh, encrusted with rock uh, from ships that had been uh, uh, sunk. Um, again, just showing the quality of the images, not too bad. Uh, we wondered if one could do tomos, uh, tomosynthesis, so not complete uh, uh, rotations, uh, to try and get improved images. And uh, 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 Matthew Marsh showed that actually one can achieve some pretty nice images with a cobalt tomosynthesis uh, type of approach. So again, there is promise for doing imaging uh, with a common, uh, with uh, a cobalt if were, you were so required. Um, the vendors are now looking at putting KV imaging uh, on their units. And I know there's a test system uh, in Canada and I believe uh, uh, other vendors are also uh, considering that. So maybe this is a bit of a moot point. And uh, the last story I'm gonna tell is just uh, um, a story on upgrading uh, the unit. Uh, towards the end of um, our, um, our uh, use of the, the uh, uh, in the last few years, we uh, actually had an opportunity to increase the, um, the uh, um, uh, source to rotation distance and to make the unit more computer controlled. And um, so we had an upgrade it was an upgrade path that Terratronics was, uh, was looking for. And uh, I'll just quickly say that when we did the analysis of uh, this new unit using TG142 type of uh, commissioning uh, expectations, uh, that the, uh, the new unit with the improved couch and the improved control met all the specs uh, that one would ask of a, a new LINAC in terms of uh, geometry and accuracy of, of, uh, uh, of uh, the orientations that one would need for the machine. Uh, except uh, at very large distances, the ODI indicator did not uh, uh, quite hit the range that you would want for a LINAC. And uh, I'm just gonna go very quickly because time is going and I, I wanna say a few other things. Um, we also, um, when we got um, the new version of Eclipse 13.6 in the AAA algorithm, one could also commission uh, the uh, cobalt beam in Eclipse. And uh, one of the graduate students that I had did that modeling. Now, the AAA algorithm asks you to essentially uh, figure out a model for multiple sources, including the primary and the secondary. And we weren't sure we would be able to do this in Eclipse because again, we don't have a, uh, a, a narrow source. You actually have this two centimeter source, but doing the same work that one would do uh, with a LINAC, we were able to, uh, um, Thomas Belinga was able to uh, get the correct parameters that enabled us to model the beam uh, very, very well and get it going in, um, in uh, 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 get it going in Eclipse. Um, for 3D conformal type calculations, uh, this particular upgrade did not have an MLC uh, with it and um, we were uh, really constrained to looking at, uh, at uh, uh, blocked uh, fields or, um, or uh, conventional fields down to uh, three by three uh, centimeters. 
and we were able to show that the dose deliveries calculations uh, and uh, the dose deliveries uh, against film measurement showed that the modeling uh, in Eclipse went very, very well. Unfortunately, uh, when we got that upgrade, we did not get a new source. So our source became very, very old and uh, it came to a time where we were no longer able to uh, do a lot of measurements on the unit uh, in a timely fashion. And uh, in fact, because of some developments in the clinic requiring the space, our cobalt unit was removed about uh, a month and a half ago. Uh, we were very sad to see it go, but Thomas is uh, driving up to Canada every now and then to do the work. Uh, this commissioning is uh, really important because it is, it's a major step going from 2D to conformal deliveries it is learning how to commission a treatment planning system. And again, each of the vendors does have a treatment planning system that they, uh, that they uh, uh, make available. And uh, I think as clinics move from 2D to the conformal deliveries, that uh, exercise in, in, in treatment planning and getting used to the treatment planning is, is uh, uh, is very, very important. We were particularly excited about doing things in Eclipse because there are a number of centers in the world that have a mixed environment where they have acquired Varian Linux and they still have cobalt and that perhaps will get them away from having two classes of delivery, one in, in uh, cobalt and one in the Linux. They could do treatment planning uh, for all of their patients. I'll just put this up for a second to show that there are uh, still three main vendors active uh, making cobalt uh, and they make a variety of different systems. So I'm near the end of my talk, uh, but I will do some editorializing. What is it that we're trying to do in radiation therapy? Well, what, what much of the work of the last decade has been about, has been, let me see if I can get my cursor over here, has been how can we improve the dose that we're giving to a target, something that we're trying to treat, and make sure that all of that target is getting 100% of the dose that it should achieve and really getting a sharp cutoff, not really overdosing. And at the same time, we've been trying to reduce the dose to organs at risk. And much of the work in IMRT and going to VMAT is to make these improvements. But what's happening in much of the world? Well, in much of the world, this is what we have. Nobody, nothing is getting any dose and all the tissues are getting no dose. So the DVH for much of what's happening in the world is not anywhere close to what we need to be treating our disease. So we need to get people on machines. Now, one can ask, but is cobalt the machine that we should get people on? Well, I'll take an example again from uh, Jake's uh, uh, um, MPI article, where he gives a graph that uh, uh, we've been using in Ontario for many, many years to show the benefits of radiation therapy. And that graph shows cervix cancer. And as Jake uh, nicely said in a, uh, a talk that he gave to the APM recently, cervix cancer is one of the cancers of great concern in the world. So it's a good application to look at. If you look at the development of radiotherapy in Ontario, this is what happened to survival curves for cervix cancer. In the early days, first when there was KV treatment in the 30s and 40s, and then when things went to the MV area, era. 
you could see great benefit extending the lives of these patients by a decade. But if you look at when this was happening, that was in this period when cobalt was king. So this benefit to the population was seen through basic good cobalt delivery. And I think this is an indication that cobalt has a role in the world today. So to end my story, I think that uh, we've been a little bit too quick in abandoning cobalt. And really some of the assumptions that drove people away from cobalt aren't really that valid. There's significant promise in cobalt-based technologies and modern delivery is well indicated. Also, working with the units that are out there and moving them forward helps centers to learn some of the things they need to learn as they progress from 2D to conformal to IMRT type of deliveries. So I think this is a very important transition. Um, I'm just gonna put up a quick slide. Uh, we had proposed to the IAEA many years ago that there actually needs to be three cobalt units out there. Um, a very basic unit that could be used anywhere in the world, um, even if the facilities are really, really uh, um, uh, not there, there's not a lot of resources. Something that is a little more sophisticated, perhaps for urban centers, and then something that is the highest end type of unit, so that high income countries will still start buying cobalt units again. And uh, the fear that this is only a technology for low and middle income countries would disappear. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I suspect I've gone on a little bit long. Uh, sorry about that, Arjit. Um, I will uh, end uh, with one little note. Uh, this is a Medical Physics for World Benefit uh, webinar. Uh, the team that has put this webinar series uh, together has done an amazing job. Uh, if you have enjoyed this seminar, uh, why don't you go to our website and see what the organization is about and consider getting involved. Uh, we're trying to do uh, uh, things to improve medical physics globally. And this webinar series is one of those uh, actions. I hope it encourages you to think of us uh, in your day-to-day -day life. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Schreiner. That was an amazing talk. A uh, lot of great questions and comments. Uh, before I begin, I do, I think I want to say that you officially broke the record for the most number of participants for a talk. And that was pretty awesome. We have about 94 uh, from pretty much like all over the world right now. So that's, uh, that's really nice. Uh, so, you know, keeping time in consideration, I'll just jump on the questions. Uh, the first one we had is, what are the advances in MLC technology in Cobalt 60 unit? So there's, uh, um, I think each of the vendors now, uh, I'm not so much sure of uh, the checks, maybe Edward can, can enlighten me on that. Uh, has an MLC unit. Uh, the design is slightly different. Um, Theratronics actually has one interesting development. They're, they are making a unit with an MLC integrated in the unit, but they also have two MLCs that you can add to the unit. One of those MLCs is a computer controlled version. The other one is a manual MLC that is really meant as a uh, conformal uh, uh, um, beam shaping. It would never be able to do IMRT, but it would be able to provide um, uh, 
uh, 3D uh, conformal type delivery. So that's a really interesting approach uh, that a number of groups have, uh, have said they would really love to have something but to get away from blocks, essentially. Um, so uh, they are out there. Uh, the add-ons have a bit of a problem because they, they reduce the clearance, uh, but for some treatments uh, uh, in the head and neck that uh, might not be a, an issue where those kinds of things are a little more important. Um, another question we had was with all these benefits utilizing cobalt units, how could we help to get industry to take notice so that they are produced and supported to increase access? Yeah, it's, that's um, a chicken and egg kind of problem. Uh, I think um, <laughs> uh, I have done my best with one particular vendor over time uh, to try and, and uh, get them to broaden their ideas. Um, over a beer, I might have some ideas that I'm not so comfortable sharing with everybody around the world uh, right now, uh, but it, it, it is a challenge. I, I think the, the vendors that are still in the game are very serious and uh, trying to do these developments, but their resources are sometimes a little more limited than some of the big companies. Before I jump into the next question, speaking of beer time, uh, just a reminder again, uh, for people interested in applying for um, the uh, for medical physics uh, world benefit to sponsor your attendance at WAPM, please do that. Uh, go to the website. Um, another interesting question we have is Cobalt 60 machine with IMRT feature have great potential for low middle income countries. How could the penumbra problem be reduced for Cobalt 60 IMRT? Uh, it won't be reduced, but the penumbra problem uh, will be captured in the treatment planning system. And so you might be doing slightly different controlling of the leaves to get that, con to get that uh, dose fall off that you need. Uh, will it be as tight as a LINAC? Uh, perhaps not. But will it be clinically uh, acceptable? For sure. So again, the penumbra issue if it's well characterized and the treatment planning system uh, knows it in a IMRT type setting where you're doing optimization, it would take that into account as it's doing the optimization of the, the, the travel, say. Okay. And uh, uh, I, sh I should say in a, in a, um, a modern <coughs> IMRT type device, you would have to do a, uh, you can't do step and shoot. You have to do dynamic leaf travel because you can't be bringing the source in and out all the time. There's shutter error effects. And, uh, you have to be a little worried about that. I did get a question. If you verified your findings according to MPPG 5A, uh, which talks about the commissioning and QA of treatment planning dose calculations, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm not quite sure. Um, we have tried to use the same um, philosophies that we use when we do our commissioning of our Linux in the commissioning of the cobalt unit. We didn't cut any corners. Okay. Uh, will dosimetry be satisfactory in step and shoot with manual MLC? That's what we're looking at right now, actually. That's what Thomas's work is right now, going up to Ottawa all the time. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, up to now, when we do blocking, the, the, the treatment planning system handles it quite well. Um, we think as long as you don't go to two small fields, uh, that it'll work quite well. But it's uh, current work. Uh, I know we are about five minutes past nine. Uh, I see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, about like more than 90 participants and people in the medical physics field from, you know, five years, 10 years, even like new medical physicists. Uh, if you don't mind, I would like to ask uh, two like rapid fire questions if you could answer. Uh, what's the best advice that you have received in your career? The best advice? Yeah. 
Um, treat everybody that you work with in the hospital as a colleague. Um, the guys in environmental services, the guys in maintenance, the physicists, uh, the radonx even, are all colleagues. They're all, every single one of those people needs to be there for the hospital to work, for the cancer center to work. And uh, show that in your day-to-day -day activities. That was the best advice I got from Irvin Pottershack. Very nice. Uh, the follow-up question would be, what is the worst advice you've ever received? <laughs> Why do you do all this fringe stuff? Nobody's interested in it. Get, get serious, do something important. Um, I think, especially in small centers where you cannot compete with groups that have five postdocs and 45 graduate students, uh, find a good niche field. Um, I'll be at Comp uh, in Quebec City if anybody wants to, to sit down with me, I have five projects that I think would be fun projects to do. Uh, for example, develop a dosimetry system that uh, will be robust enough that uh, anybody can use it in LMIC countries where they you know, have difficulty getting ion chambers and stuff. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Well, do something uh, that interests yeah. you. That's awesome. Well, uh, on that note, once again, thank you so much. Uh, this talk will be recorded and posted on our uh, YouTube website. Uh, please, all the participants, watch out, uh, look out for uh, uh, some questions by Dr. Schreiner that you will have to answer in order to receive a certificate of attendance from uh, Medical Physics World Benefit. Uh, until next time, you know, wait for our next email. We have some exciting talks lined up for the year.